All yours, God. Oh, I've got a doofer, haven't I? Right, tell you what, I'll see if it works. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. God has made all that is, and he's been involved in making these buildings. And in these parts of the world, we have Aaron's mountain range, the sleeping warrior looking over the western gales, golf course with the sea in between, that speaks of God's amazing creativity, His ability to bring all that is out of nothing. And a few other photographs that describe His, his glory and His grandeur and His beauty and His amazing ability to, to create these canvases of Aaron and surrounding area. It's all yours, God. That's what we've been reading, and that's what we believe. It all belongs to you. And just in the top left, there's Fullerton Parish Church's building. It doesn't look much from that side. It doesn't look much uh, going round the roundabout before our new connections buildings. But now people are noticing it. Now people are intrigued to know what's going on now. 178-year-old and 176-year-old buildings have been joined together in buildings that are fit for purpose. Ever since I've been here, there's been a frustration over 26 years with the buildings that they weren't fit for purpose. And now they're fit for purpose. They're fit for what purpose? The glory of God. It's not that we weren't glorifying God before, of course we were, but it's, it's that we are hopefully going to see, surely, God being glorified even more. We're going to be more flexible in what we're able to do. It's all yours, God. It's all yours. We have not to be precious about these buildings. When, when people come in and maybe, maybe abuse our buildings, yes, we have to protect them. Yes, we have to look after them, but let's not be so precious about them. Let's want these places these spaces, to be places where people from beyond these walls come. It is for others that these buildings are made. It is for others we are called to love and care and share and serve. Well, four top reasons people don't go to church, or one might change that question to God. It's a different question because one might argue that it's easier to go to God than to go to church. Um, but well, there's one reason. <laughs> it's so boring. Well, we hopefully, hopefully can, can change that perspective. Really, absolutely, seriously, so too very just crazy busy doing other things that one considers more important, I suppose. A good sleep in. Yeah. And scared to be found out. This is one of the reasons people don't perhaps speak to God or go to God except in emergency circumstances or don't come to, to church buildings, come to church services for fear of, of being found out. There was a big, big burly Australian rugby player who was invited by a friend to go to a church service, and he was on his way just up towards the door of the building, and he said to his friend, I can't go. I can't go, and I've got to go home. And the reason it turned out was that he didn't think that he deserved to go to church services. He didn't feel worthy enough to come into what he recognized as God's presence. Scared to be found out. Who may stand in His holy place? Who can come near God? Well, the psalmist tells us, people with clean hands, with a pure heart, worships only God. Real God-seekers. 
And if we look at this list, clean hands, pure heart, God seekers, worships only God, we realize that, well, while we might at times feel that we're clean, we're pure, we're God seeking, we don't always have pure hands, a clear heart, clean heart, clean hands, a pure heart. We're not always seeking God the way we might. If perfection is the qualification for entering God's presence, if complete clean, cleansing and purity is the precursor for entering God's presence, none of us, none of us are going to get in. Help. Yes, we need help. And of course, that is what they had in Israel's day, in David's day. This psalm was written for the coming of the Ark of the Covenant to be placed in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, where the high priest would go and make sacrifice for his own sins, and then on the Day of Atonement go in behind the big curtain to make sacrifice for the people's sins, the people of Israel. There above the Ark of the Covenant was recognized where God's throne was, His seat, His holy presence and power. And there's the temple that eventually was built, around which were the courtyards. The courtyard, the big one round about the temple there is, is the court of the Gentiles. That's as far as we would get. That's as close to God's presence, His holy of holies, we would be able to get without getting killed for entering into the nearer courtyards for the, for the Jewish women, for the, for the male Jews, and then the priests, and then the Holy of Holies, where the, the high priest would go that once a year on the Day of Atonement to make sacrifice for the sins of the people, and come back out having uh, declaring forgiveness for God's people. And this this is, a, this is a precursor to, to what, of course, Jesus has done for us. He is the great high priest. He has paid the price for our sins. He is the one who, who has taken the rap for us that we might be able to ascend, that we might be able to come into God's holy, pure presence, that we might be able to come with our hands cleaned, our, our hearts purified, a new desire put in our being, in our soul to, to worship God, to seek Him, to bless Him and praise Him. Jesus, we're told in all four Gospels, when He died on the cross, the veil in the temple separating the Holy of Holies from the priests and all the other courtyards was ripped from top to bottom symbolizing the way being made open for you and I to come into God's presence, to approach our living God. As Hebrews 4, 16 puts it, you know, come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. We can come honestly, openly to find our sins forgiven and our ability to look God in the eye. And today, today people take steps closer to Jesus in a meandering way. They, they have to have often lots of different experiences before they are ready to actually consider coming near God, actually consider speaking to God, actually consider coming to a church service, actually consider Christ actually might be the Savior of the world, my Savior, my Lord. Many people have to have lots of different experiences before they come to that point, before, before they're even thinking about ascending the hill of the Lord. Journeys to get, to get today often aren't straightforward, meandering. We used to think in terms of people believed, and then they belonged to the family of God, they believed in Jesus, they belonged to the family of God, and the behavior followed. And today that happens in different, different uh, 
ways. Sometimes it's behaving before belonging and believing is last. Sometimes it's belonging before behaving and believing. And as White puts it, today often people come to a cause before they will enter a community and eventually find Christ as being the source of that cause. And I say this because these buildings are now fit for that purpose of more ably helping people to join in with a cause. That you don't need to come to a church service to get involved in God's work. That might come. That might come down the line. You don't need to sign up and commit yourself to the community before you can be involved in the cause. And we trust and pray that as people join in, as they get involved with food bank, as they get involved with the cafe, as they get involved with different things, as we seek to promote caring relationships, as we seek to promote the celebration of life in its fullness, that's attractive to people. Church often isn't on the surface, and Christ is perhaps more attractive to people. We want to commend this cause of Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He loves us. He shows us God's love like no other. This is one of our vision statements. The church we see learns to eat, weep, laugh, celebrate, and share our whole lives with God and one another, creating a captivating, compelling community which invites outsiders in and highly values visitors. Some of you pointed me to Songs of Praise. You maybe saw last Sunday's Songs of Praise. Watched it on iPlayer. And here's St. James's Church in West Hampstead, London. It looks like your average Church of England. Ancient, old, actually dying in terms of people. But, wait for it, there it is now. It's a thoroughfare. It's a happening place. There's coming and going. There's that soft play in the left there. There's a post office there. Yeah, they go and sell, folks sell stamps in, in, in the church there. You go to your post office in this church building. And maybe you're thinking, well, Neil, I don't want I don't want my church buildings to be turned into a marketplace. I don't want to be, I don't want to be in a situation where, I, like Jesus, I want to t- turn over the, the money changers, like in this photograph. But remember, remember what Jesus was doing here. What was happening here was the changing of money from people all over the world was raking in the shekels. They were abusing they were charging too much money for the changing of of their currency to be able to buy the goat, the the lamb, the dove, the sacrifice that they were making. And then they were getting charged with a bumped up price as well. And it was happening in the court of the Gentiles. It was happening where it shouldn't be happening. It should have been down before people came into that area. But what was happening What Jesus was so livid about was that they had changed his God's house into a den of thieves. Because what was happening was these people were stopping others coming to God. They were getting in the way of people coming to God, coming near the Holy of Holies, coming near his his pure and perfect, loving presence. And here is where they gather on Sundays and other times of the week to worship (laughs) right beside a a lovely big soft play. A great picture. What we have, what we have in our buildings is the opportunity to become more the church that eats, weeps, laughs, celebrates, and shares our whole lives with God and one another creating a captivating, compelling community which invites outsiders in and highly values visitors. You see, because we have a 
a cafe here now. Because we have these buildings here, people, people want to come in. People want to look. And people want to have a cuppa. We heard from Heather, the uh, North Ayrshire Council folk, can he wait to get their lunch here? We hope and pray it won't be that far away. People who would never normally darken the door of a church building want to come here. That's what we want to encourage. There will be things that happen in this sanctuary, and as we're calling it also, this auditorium, that some of us might be a bit uneasy about. But please remember, what we're doing is we're trying to encourage things happening here that help people take steps closer to Jesus and to recognize in Him their Savior and Lord. That's what all of this is about. Yes, we have to watch. We have to watch that things don't get in the way. We have to watch that, that our motives are right. We have to watch what happens here as well. It's not that everything can happen here, but there will be dances here. There will be bands playing here. There will be drama. There will be schools of dance dancing at the front here. There will be different things happening in our cafe, in our Fullerton Hall and schoolroom, in our studio. Lots of different things happening. We want to encourage so much more to happen so that people coming here start to make connections. What's this all about? And all so much more important is that we, the people of God, are ready to welcome them, that we are growing into this community that is hospitable, that is recognizing other people on the fringes and bringing them in. Will King Jesus come in? Well, yes, he, He's already here. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Will He come into our heart? Yes, He's at home in many of our hearts, if not all of our hearts. If we've invited Him in, He is, he is at home. He is, he's here. But is He Lord? Is He King? Are we giving Him the place that is His due? For these buildings to become fit for purpose, we need to be fit for purpose too. We need to be able to ensure that these buildings are used well by being at work here and serving here as well as in the world. Will King Jesus come in to our heart? Yes. Perhaps, perhaps you realize now that there's a missing piece in your heart, in your life, that only Jesus can meet. Well, open that heart. Open that, your life. Let Him come in with the purpose and the power to live the way He wants you to live. It may be that you're simply more intrigued now, and follow that up. Start talking to this God who might exist. Start opening yourself to the possibilities that we've been hearing about today. Get involved in the cause without having to commit yourself to the community, to Christ. Come, come, let's open our hearts to Jesus. This is what we're calling Homecoming Sunday. But I have to say that it's not so much about us coming home to these buildings. Much more important is about God coming home to our hearts and into our lives.